Welcome to Let's Talk Live on the Orthodox Christian Network. Sixty-five percent of Americans report viewing some kind of worship or other spiritual content online, which is why in 2021 we offered over 280 programs through MyOCN Community and our online partnerships, reaching over 51,000 people. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor-supported ministry. We rely on donors like you to keep these programs free and available. So if you're able, please consider making a contribution today. And as always, please support us through your prayers and by sharing this content with your friends and family. With that, let's get into today's interview. Today we have the second in a series of conversations about the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Last time, we got an overview of the humanitarian crisis unfolding and the international response and discussed how we as Christians can form an orthodox political theology. Today, we're diving a bit deeper into the historical and political factors at play. We have some very special guests, and I'm going to introduce them all together so that we can then dive right into the questions. Our first guest, Dr. Cheryl Cross, is director of Kosmetsky Center at St. Edward's University and Global Policy Scholar at Keenan Institute Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. She held previous appointments as professor at the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies in Germany and distinguished professor of political science at the U.S. Air Force Academy. Dr. Cross has extensive teaching and publication experience in international relations with area concentrations on Russia, Eurasia, and Southeast Europe. Her most recent book co-authored with Paul Bolt entitled China, Russia, and the 21st Century Global Geopolitics was published by Oxford University Press in 2018. Nicholas K. Govostev, I have to say, I know his father, so I'm gonna be, this is a, what do they say, full disclosure. He and his father and I served in South Florida and Fort Lauderdale for many years as priests. Nicholas is a professor of national security affairs at the US Naval War College. He holds a non-residential fellowship with the Foreign Policy Research Institute as the editor of Orbis and the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs as co-host of the Doorstep podcast. He is a member of the Loisa Group and a contributing editor of the National Interest. Dr. Elizabeth Prodromo is a faculty member at the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where she directs the Initiative on Religion, Law, and Diplomacy. She is a non-resident senior fellow and co-chair of the Working Group on Christians and Religious Pluralism in the Middle East at the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute and was the non-resident senior fellow in national security and Middle East at the Center for American Progress. She is a co-president of the Religions for Peace. Dr. Prodromo served as vice chair and commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom from 2004 to 2012 and was a member of the U.S. Secretary of State Religion and Foreign Policy Working Group 2011 to 2015. Deacon Nicholas Dorisenko served as the Yokram Professor and Chair and concurrently as Associate Professor of Theology at Valparaiso University. In his research, he has explored the intersections of liturgical history, religious studies, and pastoral theology, and writes for an ecumenical audience. He is currently working on the people's faith, the liturgy of the faithful in orthodoxy to be published by Roman and Littlefield. His next book, The Orthodox Church in Ukraine, a Century of Separation was published by Northern Illinois University Press in fall of 2018. He is an ordained deacon of the Orthodox Church in America since 2003. Now, that's a mouthful. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of knowledge. And now we're going to try to pick it apart with these special people. Let's go first to Dr. Cross. Cheryl, welcome to the program. Following the end of the Cold War, it seems that U.S.-Russia relations have never repaired and have indeed maybe even worsened over the last decade. How have Russia's activities in Ukraine impacted its relationship with the rest of the world from 2014, the annexation of Crimea, until the situation that we're seeing unfortunately unfold today? Thank you very much, uh, Father Christopher, and thank you for the invitation to uh, contribute to the forum here today on such a critical and important topic, which is 
uh, obviously consequential, not only for the Eurasian region, but uh, predictably uh, for the entire global uh, security configuration and, and world order. Um, 30 years ago, at the time that I was a graduate student at UCLA and the Rand Corporation in the 1980s, we were uh, you know, in seminars looking at where people were standing on the Kremlin wall, uh, limited communication, we had to rely on these methods. And then with the introduction of Glasnost, Perestroika and new thinking during the Gorbachev era, just at the time that I was finishing my dissertation, everything was opening up. And uh, it was a fascinating time, uh, a time of uh, a lot of uh, speculation about the future, uh, opportunities for collaboration and engaging with uh, scholars of the entire former Soviet bloc. So I was able to start uh, uh, dialogue and communication and academic collaboration with my colleagues in Russia and Ukraine, communicating them with them in the same way I do with uh, Dr. Elizabeth Padramo or Nick Bozdiev and others. Um, and it was important uh, for understanding, for thinking about where we could go in the relationship. And we, we were, uh, I would say, in an optimistic uh, period. Uh, but very sadly, uh, as a result of a number of developments over the last decades, and particularly since 19, uh, 2014, 2014, with Russia's annexation of Crimea, things have turned in a very different uh, direction. And I think we're uh, in a situation now uh, in circumstances where in fact another iron curtain uh, may be closing again. Uh, today, I would say the level of tension between Russia and the West is at the highest point in my lifetime. I would say even higher than the period uh, preceding the collapse of the Soviet Union. One might even argue that the circumstances were more predictable during the period of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine marks the largest mobilization of kinetic force in Europe since the end of the Cold War. The war in Ukraine regrettably has, has and will continue to result in tragic loss of life and suffering, uh, dislocation of the Ukrainian population leading to a massive refugee exodus affecting uh, Ukraine's European neighbors and beyond. And there's certainly a risk of escalation of this conflict to involve neighboring NATO nations evoking an Article 5 response in a direct clash with a major world nuclear power. Russia's conflict has been accelerating since 2014 annexation of Crimea and Moscow's backing of separatist forces in Donbass. And while the scale of the military incursion has shocked many, uh, I say in other ways that uh, it was entirely predictable. Uh, this war has two major issues or sources. First is Russia's dissatisfaction with the post-Cold War security architecture in Europe. Since the 1990s, Russia's leadership and foreign and defense communities have consistently opposed NATO enlargement. And it isn't just Vladimir Putin. I've worked uh, can, uh, extensively with this community for a long time, and there's been a widespread perception that somehow the West took advantage of Russia's weakened position following the collapse of the Soviet Union to expand the alliance toward the East. And these concerns became even more serious in 2008 when US President George Bush vowed to press for membership of Ukraine and Georgia and NATO. NATO attempted to respond to Moscow's apprehension about enlargement of the alliance by taking steps like instituting the NATO-Russia Council as a consultative body to promote collaboration on shared security challenges. Attention, attentions remain over issues such as Moscow expecting to exercise veto authority over NATO decisions deemed objectionable to Russia's interests and the perception that NATO simply served American interests as the dominant power in the alliance. There was an initial expectation, I would say, that Russia and the United States could emerge from the period of the Cold War as co-equals. There were hopes that the United States and Russia could build a strategic partnership. The first foreign policy concept of the Russian Federation, the military doctrine, expressed commitment to building democracy and free market economies in Russia, developing ties with Western democratic nations, 
but largely uh, at the point of the 1999 NATO era campaign in the former Yugoslavia, it triggered a serious reassessment, a sobering reassessment within Moscow's foreign policy circles about what the potential of cooperation and collaboration in the security sphere with the United States and with Western countries would be. I would say that there's absolutely no question that NATO together with the European Union were there in the post-Soviet period to provide invaluable support to nations in Europe and Eurasia and democratization and defense transformation. But I think we have to recognize that these relationships for NATO have come with the cost of alienating Russia, just as George Kennan had predicted. The second major issue is that Putin is clearly threatened by Ukraine's democratic aspirations and progress toward integration in the Euro-Atlantic security and economic communities. Russia's military campaign uh, in Ukraine can be seen as a manifestation of a broader global struggle underway where major authoritarian powers, Russia and China, challenge the rules-based liberal democratic order that has provided stability and security in the international system since the end of the Second World War. Russia and China share the desire, they have a sense that they should be entitled to have some say about the rules, about the norms, about the features of any kind of world order. In some ways, uh, China definitely has benefited by the rules-based international order, helping to give their, uh, provide the basis and foundation for China's rise in the international system. And uh, Russia, Russian scholars and colleagues typically say they're not against the idea of a rules-based order, but it, it has to be an order where the rules are jointly established, jointly negotiated. I would say that it's important to understand that both Beijing and Moscow uh, share the view that the Arab Spring, colored revolutions uh, have resulted in chaos from their perspective. Uh, they fear this kind of uh, intervention and involvement on the part of the West in their countries. In Ukraine, Juro Maidan revolution and progress on a trajectory toward uh, democratic transformation and integration with uh, Western nations was clearly perceived as jeopardizing the Kremlin's capacity to ensure that the leadership in Kiev would function in ways that were favorable or would be favorable over the long term to Moscow's interests. One last quick point. You raised the issue of trust uh, among your questions for the discussion today and prior uh, to 2014, we were talking a lot in the academic community about how we could overcome this deficit of trust that was developing in the US-Russia bilateral relationship. Initially, Russia and the West cooperated on, in peacekeeping in the context of the NATO-Russia Council. They, there was uh, valuable uh, areas of cooperation in counterterrorism. Vladimir Putin was the first world leader, in fact, on 9-11 to call George Bush to pledge commitment to support the United States at that time. Right. We were continuing in the early uh, post-Cold War period, the traditions established during the Soviet era for cooperation and strategic arms control and nuclear proliferation. But 2014 was a real turning point and after February 24th this year, it's certainly difficult to imagine ways in which any level of trust might be restored and very troubling possibilities remain for further de uh, destructive escalation of this conflict, which is uh, very concerning. And I think that in this case, there are enormous costs, particularly to the, to the population of Ukraine, but also for Europe, for the United States, and certainly also for the broader world community. So I wish it was a, a happier occasion and a happier topic, but uh, in many ways, it's a, a very difficult and it's hard to be optimistic going forward on this issue. Okay. Thank you. No, no, that's good. Those are, those are good intro to quite a few of the other questions that we have, not only for you, but for other guests. And so there's a, a primary lack of trust that has continued since the Cold War is from what I'm hearing from you, but I'm not trained in your field. That's what I'm hearing. And I'm also hearing that maybe there were recent material interests at play. Can you address that issue? I think there are, you know, we had to be realistic. Again, during that early period, there were very high expectations, but definitely between Russia and the United States, there are differences in geopolitical, 
strategic interests that come up and we try to manage this. There was also, uh, every time you had a presidential transition, there were uh, often this idea that we'll reset the relationship. And we sort of set these high expectations on how we could do a better job getting along. But I think that legacy of the East-West confrontation, the Soviet era, was definitely a play in the mindset of many. And it was always sort of like, you need to choose between Russia and the West. You either have to be on one side or the other side. And this hardened positions, and to me, and what I spent most of the last 10 years talking about and speaking in the European and Eurasian security forums is in the interests of peace and in the interests of the best interests of all nations involved. There's no reason why a country like Ukraine could not have productive relationships with the Eastern partners, especially Russia, also China, while simultaneously developing closer ties with the Euro-Atlantic community in the security and economic sphere. Going back to the concept that Mikhail Gorbachev had of the common European home, you know, Russia is a European country. You're not going to have peace, stability, and security with all these problems in Russia. So I think, but we, in many ways, I think it's been a self-fulfilling prophecy that we find ourselves in this situation today. And it's, uh, you know, uh, very difficult to see the way forward with uh, all that's taken place, um, especially in the last few years and after February the 24th. And that's why I'm so concerned. And I think we had a great opportunity as a world community in the early 90s to move forward in a more positive way. We just came out of this pandemic. We should be working together as a global community, helping nations in area of health, security, and our common interests and needs. And instead, we've got a massive ground, ground war launched in Europe that's gonna be quite costly for all involved. And, uh, you know, here we are. Okay. Uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine, how are they being interpreted from a strategic perspective? I mean. Does Russia see its hostility toward Ukraine as primarily directed at its neighbor, or is it more so a conflict with NATO, by extension, more significant Western powers? We've intimated that a little bit here, but I wonder if you want to dive into that a little more. I mean, Vladimir Putin wrote a, a, a very long essay in July of 2021 where he was talking about uh, the history of Russia and Ukraine and his interpretation of that history and is suggesting that the Russians and Ukrainians were one people. Uh, and he, he speaks in there about uh, an anti-Russian agenda. In fact, I've got the report sitting here and he says, to quote him, uh, we are witnessing not just complete dependence, but direct external control, including the supervision of the Ukrainian authorities, security services and armed forces by foreign advisors, military development of the territory of Ukraine and deployment of NATO infrastructure. So he's clearly pointing to uh, the, the involvement of NATO external powers on the territory of Ukraine nation bordering the Russian Federation. So I don't think that it's uh, correct to suggest that at least initially that uh, Putin was saying they wanna retake Ukraine, they want to retake its uh, former neighboring nations in Georgia, but they did definitely wanted to make sure that the governments that uh, had authority within those countries were not going to work against the interests of the Kremlin. So it's a, it's a reaction to uh, the, Ukraine, Georgia before uh, moving closer to the West and it'll be involved in the country. And even though you know Ukraine was not a candidate for NATO membership at any time in the foreseeable future, uh, there's this concern, uh, this constant expression over the last decades about uh, NATO's advancing closer to the borders of the Russian Federation. And I think this is also tied to this sense of loss of status after the end of the Cold War. Russia still has a sense as a, as a great power in the international community, they want to be able to have uh, influence and say on issues. And uh, it's a, a long, a long uh, uh, numerous steps involved in understanding how uh, they feel like, uh, you know, the, the threat from the West uh, could eventually be a threat to the interests of the Russian Federation. Uh, 
in terms of their regional areas and particularly the democratic project underway within Ukraine. After what they saw in the Arab Spring, after what they've seen in, in the colored revolutions, this is a major concern that I think Putin shares with the leadership in China as well about the potential for domestic unrest that could threaten the stability of these authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. And their power base, right? And their yes. power base. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you this, from your perspective and your knowledge, um, is or was Ukraine being utilized as a puppet or a pawn from outside governments? Because we hear this often uh, in, uh, in the conversations about this issue. Uh, and that, that focused Russia's attention to go in and take it over. Well, I mean, you know, uh, Ukraine is a nation that uh, is in a process of, of de uh, de democratic transition and there are uh, competing political forces within Ukraine. And, you know, building democracy is not an easy process. It's a difficult process. And there's no qu question that the West has been involved, you know, through NATO, through the EU. But I think if I pointed to anything, maybe we, we in some circles at least, it's sort of like there had to be a choice. You're either going one way or the other way. And there might've been a more moderate path. And there's been a couple of times when uh, Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky has suggested that maybe uh, Ukraine now can uh, you know, move towards some kind of a security agreement that would protect uh, Ukraine in the event of violations of sovereignty and, and uh, not have to become a, you know, sort of move away from the idea that they would become a NATO member. The problem with that is, you know, finding some kind of an agreement that could be enforced and that they could count on over time. Because for example, if we go back to the 1994 Budapest memorandum where Ukraine surrendered its nuclear weapons with the pledge on the part of the United States, the UK and Russia, that their sovereignty would not be violated, they find themselves in the situation that they're in today. But I also think that it's true that had NATO membership not been on the table, we might have avoided this war altogether. Mm -hmm. So I would say that we need to work harder at trying to find solution, trying to, you know, Henry Kissinger last week at Davos suggested we need to start working toward that this is a time for diplomacy and for working for a peace settlement. He's concerned about the repercussions of this conflict over time. Uh, and this is a, this, we could talk about this more later. I also want to hear from the other, other speakers and panelists, and I'm sure you do too, but uh, I think his concerns are legitimate. I understand where he's coming from. It's not going to be easy to find a viable solution, but I also think that the road ahead, continuing this conflict, is very risky with potential, uh, very, you know, extremely difficult uh, sacrifices and consequences for Ukraine, first of all, the region, for Russia, for Europe, and the broader world community. When you talk about the food security issues for Africa and the rest of the world, I mean, we, sh we as a world community, I think, should be able to do better in finding solutions that, that can work for all parties. And I hear too much discussion about continued military support and not enough about finding a peaceful diplomatic settlement here. Okay. Uh, before we go to uh, Dr. Gabostev, I have one more question. You touched on it a little bit. Uh, that is, and we did touch it last time, nuclear conflict. It seems clear that uh, open conflict of any kind between Russia and the U.S. or U.S. allies is to be avoided at all possible costs. In that case, what would a resolution look like in your eyes in this situation? And that may be hard to figure out, but just a thought from you. Well, I, I think, you know, we need to think very carefully about every uh, escalation. I mean, first of all, you know, Ukraine mo has moved into this uh, on the path of Euro-Atlantic integration, membership in the EU, NATO, democratization, uh, with our encouragement, encouragement from the United States and the West, and they've, they've undertaken uh, this uh, effort at enormous costs and risks to their nation. I mean, the very survival. This is the, the survival of their country and society. There's already been enormous loss of life. And, uh, and I, first of all, think about that. I think about 
elderly people in Donbass now that are being, you have to, can't leave their homes and have to stay, stay there with health conditions anyway, listening to bombing constantly, children that have lost their parents and so on. Most of all, I feel for the enormous cost involved. And every escalation of military force leads, I mean, I don't think that Russia or Putin are in a position where they're gonna say, we give up and we're gonna stop here. So we have to think about those consequences. Humanitarian and economic support, no question. We have a, a moral obligation at this point to support Ukraine. But we need to think very carefully about the escalation of military support, military aid. President Biden first said, I'm not gonna give sophisticated rockets to Ukraine. Now they are going to give these rockets to Ukraine. And President Zelensky said, they will not be used on the soil of the Russian Federation. But I think it's gonna be very difficult for him to enforce and control that in a war situation. Mm -hmm. So you can see all kinds of ways that this could escalate that it could, that there could be spillover involving NATO countries leading to invoking, uh, evoking an Article 5 response, and then you have a NATO-Russia conflict. Also, at what point, you know, if Putin feels cornered enough that his options are limited enough, could he resort to the use of tact tactical nuclear weapons? I think your, your speaker last week was very clear in recognizing the risks. And I would add further to that that those who talk about some of our colleagues uh, on the Beltway who talk about, uh, you know, pushing Russia to become some kind of, this is the largest country on the face of the earth, to, to push them into some kind of pariah state status or uh, to encourage an implosion of Russia, need to think very carefully about the consequences of a development like that for regional and global security and okay. what it could mean for the entire world community. So those factors have to be considered and these decisions are quite uh, potentially uh, significant and have to be really carefully thought out. And that's why I think I agree with the idea that we, we need our diplomats working very hard simultaneously, trying to, to, to find a way that we could bring this uh, conflict that's causing so much uh, hardship and with so much potential cost ahead to some kind of a conclusion. Okay, well, very good. And I, I've known from my study of history, which I'm not a great historian, but I know enough that when you take power and you take people, it's usually the people that suffer because the power mongers, they want to control. And good Lord, if you look, as you said, you look at the images of the elderly, uh, those who are handicapped, who are stuck in their homes while the bombs go off or they come outside to grab some water a mile or two away. This is a humanitarian crisis, uh, the likes of which I've never seen in my life. So I hope and pray that, uh, you know, it will move forward. We'll come back to you in a little bit, doctor, but thank you for those. Uh, Dr. Nicholas, I want to come to you next. And um, let me ask you, what are some of the major issues um, and concerns with Russia right now, you think, that are motivating these decisions that they're making? Well, first, uh, let me build on what Cheryl responded. And this isn't just about geopolitics, NATO enlargement, the question of the European community. If we look at what President Putin, Foreign Minister Lavrov, Speaker of the Federation Council, Valentina Matvienko, uh, Patriarch Kirill, uh, they're all phrasing this conflict, not just simply in geopolitical terms, but in civilizational terms. And yeah. I think that that's a factor that we haven't paid enough attention to. Mm -hmm. um, the, the conception of the Russian elite, and we can say whether it's sincere or not, that's a separate question. But the Russian elite is presenting a narrative to the Russian people that Russia represents a distinct orthodox civilization that in the past, this was a part of traditional European civilization, but now the West, Brussels in the European Union, Washington in the United States represent a postmodern Western civilization, which is not only different uh, from Russia's civilization, but is actively opposed to it, uh, is competing with it. That Russia views the basis of this civilization as extending beyond the territory of the Russian Federation, so this brings us to the question of where does Ukraine fit in? And uh, Cheryl referred to Putin's articles. Uh, 
uh, talking about this and others who talk about a, a common kind of orthodox civilizational space, and that the expansion of the West is not just simply about NATO membership, security guarantees, uh, the sense that what's happening in Ukraine is Ukraine is being ripped away from its orthodox core. Now, of course, the Ukrainians are going to have a very different perspective on this. I'm right. trying to give you a sense of the Russian view right. of this. Uh, and that, in essence, we look at this and we say these are the two of the largest orthodox countries in the world. And yet the narrative in, in, in Russia is that uh, you know, Ukraine now represents, uh, its civilization is perverted, it's being kind of pulled into a postmodern Western world, which will be inimical, and that Russia is fighting to defend uh, this uh, Slavic Orthodox civilization from being, uh, being weakened, right? You really have some of these themes that the loss, and they, they use the term loss, the loss of Ukraine would represent a, a major blow to the integrity of this uh, single civilizational space. And so when we're looking at what motivates people to fight, to take loss, right? Because the Russians are losing casualties. They are, they're, they're, they're having economic costs. Uh, people don't necessarily fight and die for geopolitical statements. They do fight and die for civilizational ones. And the fact that Russia is couching this conflict and, and that they're couching it in terms of a liberation, where right? we have to go in to liberate our brothers and sisters uh, from this uh, postmodern Western tyranny, which is being imposed on them. And that gets to your earlier question, that the, that the Russian narrative keeps insisting that this is Westerners coming into Ukraine, and that, as you said, the government is being responsive to uh, Western advisors. Uh, the fact that you have these banners in Russia that say, you know, we have not forgotten you, we are with you, we are coming to free you. The fact that Ru the Russian military honestly believed in the first days of the war that when the Russian paratroopers landed outside of Kiev in Kharkov uh, and elsewhere, that they would be welcomed, that the local people were waiting for them to liberate right. them, speaks very clearly to this, uh, to this sense of civilizational divide. Uh, and that is something that I think our policymakers in Washington have difficulty with. We've always had difficulty, uh, and this is where I think Elizabeth and, and, and Deacon Nicholas can also help spell this out. We have difficulty in understanding the motivation of religion, the motivation of culture, the motivation of civilization, and yet these are, are fundamental issues. For their part, by the way, Ukrainians are also now beginning, not only, you know, and, and, and Ukra you know, Ukrainians, both Russian-speaking, Ukrainian-speaking, uh, Ukrainians that belong to the OCU, Ukrainians that have, are still, until this week, part of the Moscow Patriarchate, are really beginning to reassess how are they going to be connected to this, uh, to their neighbor to the east, and is this really going to snap some of those remaining civilizational links? So and it's a moral this, conflict as well. It's a it's moral a, conflict. It's, That's it's, it's being phrased as a moral conflict. When, right. when Patriarch Kirill talks about this, really, he, he starts invoking the language of well, we don't use crusade in, in, our, in our thinking, but he's, he's, he's akin to that, right? This is a fight against evil. This is a fight against uh, postmodern decadence, which will corrupt the Orthodox world if it's allowed to spread. And we had to go in to stop it. Uh, the fact that he's couched that in those terms beyond this is about NATO, beyond this is about democracy, I think uh, is really telling. And it does make resolution of this crisis more difficult. Let me ask you this, Nicholas. Is it accurate, uh, in your view, to characterize Putin, the Putin government specifically, or Vladimir Putin himself, as a primary cause of the conflict? Would an internal, let's say, change of power, were it possible, be likely to lead to any different course, in your opinion? There's a remarkable degree of consistency within the Russian political and national security elite. Uh, if you watch the consecration uh, last year of the, the new cathedral for the military yes. uh, outside of Moscow, uh, that I think epitomizes this fusion that has been occurring in Russia over the last number of years of fusing orthodoxy, the great power legacy of the former Soviet state, the imperial legacy, tying it up in this civilizational language, which 
uh, ironically comes from the white emigres uh, that left the Soviet Union after the revolution, but Putin has been really interested in reintegrating that. So Berdyaev and the Eurasianists and others. Uh, and that is something which the elite as a whole, again, whether they personally believe it or not, they see it as a tool of legitimacy. This is the language that they speak. If Putin were to disappear tomorrow, we have these reports, he's sick, he has cancer, he may not have that long to live. Uh, and, you know, another figure arises, whether it's uh, Patrushev or Mishustin, the prime minister, or Dmitry Medvedev, uh, or any of these other figures, you're not going to really, you might have change in tactics, you might have change in strategy, but the overarching view that Russia uh, is not a part of the West, that the West is inimical to Russia, that Russia needs to be writing the rules, as Cheryl said, uh, not having the rules imposed on it. That's a pretty consistent view, not only of the elite, but we're seeing it perpetuated into the next two generations of Russian leaders, right? So it's not just simply, well, if Putin goes and we get a younger person in place, uh, we're seeing this among the next generation of Russian figures that are rising in Russian politics, the governors, the 30 and 40 somethings, they all uh, at least publicly talk in this type of language. So I'm not as sanguine about the idea that this is just about one person and you remove the one person and, and you get suddenly systemic change. Even a figure like Alec, uh, Alexei Navalny, the uh, anti-corruption crusader who's currently in jail, uh, is a po uh, opponent of the Putin regime, supported the annexation of Crimea, uh, in the past has talked uh, in somewhat less than glowing terms about diversity and, and talks about Russian nationalism. So even with figures that we would say, well, if we got Navalny as president of Russia, again, they might change policy, they might change tactics, but this view that Russia, that Cheryl laid out, that Russia kind of was uh, not treated well after the Cold War, that Russia had this settlement imposed on it, um, that's a view that you find pretty broadly within, within Russian society, and it's why the Russian opinion polling, even with opinion polling always suspect, why we have not seen, other than in the first couple of weeks, this massive kind of re rejection uh, of the war. I think during the, um, I think the Ottoman Empire, we would say that um, they would pray for the death of the Sultan, but then they would say, well, wait a minute, if the Sultan dies, his son may be worse than him. So we never know what's coming up, but th these perspectives are very good. So let me ask you this, uh, there's mixed opinions within Russia about the conflict, we're hearing different things. Some support the actions of the government, others protest the actions of the government. We have a state media run network there that really pumps out what the government wants to put forward. Um, what is your understanding of what's going on there? Do you think that expressed public opinion within Russia has the potential to even affect any decisions that they make? Yeah, it does, because uh, even in authoritarian states, you still need the consent of the governed to function. Uh, and what we've seen is that uh, the Russian government currently is, is, is supporting the invasion of Ukraine primarily based on its peacetime military. They're not mobilizing. Uh, they're not calling up large numbers of draftees. There's a sense, and we've seen the prime minister and others have, have kind of quietly been uh, subtly been making this argument uh, that that might cause unrest. Uh, also for economic reasons, you can't pull that many people out of the economy without creating uh, severe dislocations. What we've seen, and again, some of this is more anecdotal. Um, first of all, interestingly enough, some of the strongest opponents of the invasion, not just simply from the expected pro-Western uh, areas, but have been from among the communists. Uh, the communist party uh, is wavering on this because in part they see this as a fratricidal conflict, right? Why are we, you know, we're all, we were all part of the Soviet Union, so why are we, why are we doing this? You've seen some opposition from within the Orthodox Church that have described this as a fratricidal war. We're killing our own brothers and sisters uh, and in kind of opposition to uh, the tone laid out by the patriarch. Uh, last month, about 300 priests signed a uh, a statement saying that this is an immoral, this is a fratricidal war that uh, should not be going on. On the other hand, we do have reports, because again, keeping in mind that there are still many family ties between Ukraine and Russia, 
you do have Ukrainians reporting that they're communicating to their relatives in Russia about what's happening. And in some cases, their relatives are saying, no, 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 that's not happening. You know, what you're describing isn't really, you know, you, we're, we're, our intentions are good, we're coming in to help you. Uh, and so there is some uh, dissonance, uh, cognitive dissonance, where uh, at least among some segments of the Russian population, uh, there's a willingness to accept that this is being done as a special operation. Its goal is to liberate, uh, that they're pushing back against Nazis. It's not, it's not accidental that uh, the Russian government is linking this conflict to World War II, uh, that they use the term Nazis to apply to uh, Ukrainian government forces in the West, and also that they refer to the Russian and Donetsk and Lugansk militias as the allied forces as allied forces, right? So we're, we're recreating this language of World War II where the Russians are the allies and those that they're fighting in Ukraine uh, are the Nazis. Oh, boy. Uh, Nicholas, uh, I have one more question for you before we go to Dr. Prodromo. Um, the Western governments frequently threaten and we have now applied sanctions as a method of motivating the behavioral changes that we see. Um, is this likely to be effective in the long run? And what actions are needed in, from the US to have, let's say, a positive effect on the current situation? Because we go back to Dr. Cross in the beginning, to Cheryl, if we wanna do something positive here. What's your thoughts? Well, the problem with sanctions is we often, we in the US apply sanctions based on mirror imaging. We'd say, well, what would Americans accept in terms of gas prices or food prices? And we say, well, if Americans won't accept something, then no one else will. Uh, whereas what we've seen in, in, in the Russian context is that there is a willingness to, to accept sanctions. Um, people may not be happy about it, uh, but there's a willingness. Uh, and in turn, the, Russians are, the Russian government is very confident that their counter sanctions on, and Cheryl referred to this, the food, uh, energy, commodities. Uh, today, the Russians are announcing they're not going to sell commodities for semiconductor production. Um, that, that they're going to test our willingness. How, will, how willing are we to support Ukraine if we're paying $10 a, ga a gallon for gas, if, if food prices have tripled, so on and so forth. So the Russians are also, they're measuring our willingness to accept uh, these economic costs. Really, Father, your question, uh, but you know, it comes back to a fundamental one. I don't have an answer. I can only give you the two perspectives. One is that the perspective is, is that you need to bring this conflict to an end as quickly as possible. And one way is you dip uh, what former Secretary Kissinger proposed in Davos, you propose a settlement, Ukraine is forced to give up territory, it's forced to accept uh, conditions to end the war, which the Ukrainian government and people may not want, but that's what ends the war. The other is to uh, even more quickly build up Ukraine's capacity to fight uh, to raise the military cost for Russia to such a point that Russia cannot sustain the conflict anymore, recognizing that it's much more destructive in the short term, but you're hoping to get to a long-term solution. But then you have to balance the, the risk of escalation. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, as we see, the West is trying to determine, well, another, another round of sanctions and another round of arms deliveries to Ukraine, is this going to be what what tips the balance, and it's too early to tell. Thank you for joining us today. You can find all of our upcoming events at myocn.net, in addition to daily articles, live worship links, and other resources. We hope you'll join us again, and until then, thank you. Thank you.